Hey, everyone. Just wanted to take a moment to thank you for listening to the show. We're thrilled that you're here and enjoying the content. This podcast is completely free for you, but if you'd ever consider supporting the show, we truly appreciate it. One way you can do that is by using our affiliate links. These are links to products and services that we've mentioned on the show. And if you make a purchase through one of them, we might earn a small commission at no extra cost to you. It's a great way to show your love for the podcast and help us keep creating awesome content. Blah, 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 blah. Welcome to the Our Forever Smiles podcast, a podcast created to support mothers of children who were born with clefts and those who love them. I'm your host, Laura Arroyo, and I'm also a mother of a daughter who was born with a surprise cleft palate. I know the challenges you face every day. Whether you have just learned the difficult news of your baby's cleft lip or palate, you're in the midst of pre-op or post-op, or you're an OG cleft mom, this podcast is for you. In a weekly conversation, we will talk about everything from feeding and speech therapy to surgery and school. We'll share tips from guest experts and advocates and even share a little joy in the process. You can listen to Our Forever Smiles wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to the Our Forever Smiles Clef Mom Diaries and Support Podcast. I am Laura Arroyo. Thank you to all of our subscribers, new and old. I appreciate all of the support that we've received from this wonderful community. You can listen to us via Apple, Spotify, and everywhere that podcasts are available. Don't forget to subscribe either. That really helps us show up in the algorithms so that all Clef Moms can find us and It's just helpful to build awareness. As a note, we are not medical doctors and we we do not intend for you to use the information that we share here as medical advice. We are parents and advocates who love our children and we are sharing our own personal experiences. Our guest today is, however, a speech language pathologist. And so she will have some tips and tricks for you today. Um, However, just keep in mind that you will always consult with your personal uh, medical doctors before starting anything new or, or using or implementing any of these tips that we share. So our guest today is Micah. Micah is a speech language pathologist with 25 years of experience in adult and pediatric populations within the last decade has spent that has was spent in level two and level three neonatal intensive care units. She is the founder and owner of Micah Clark LLC and is passionate about empowering parents of infants to build competent connections with their babies, especially during feedings. Micah is also a board certified neonatal therapist, a NICU parent coach, and just completed her certificate as a lactation counselor. She loves helping parents feed their babies with competence and clarity, building bonds from the beginning that lead to lifelong relational connection. Welcome, Micah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. So many things, so many feelings that I've had before we started this, the episode I was, I shared with Micah that my daughter Giselle did have to spend some time in the NICU and it was really challenging for me. And when I look back at photos, a lot of things, a lot of things are like a blur. And sometimes I feel like I've shared with people like, oh, Giselle was in the NICU for two weeks or Giselle was in the NICU for a week. But when I look back at the pictures, I can get a better timeline of actually how long she was there. And she was actually there for about five days. And it was the longest five days of my life. I feel like I was sharing with Micah that I had such a longing for her that I didn't ex- not that I didn't expect to have but that I that felt unnatural for me it felt very strange to long for someone that I barely knew because I'm a first time mom and I did she was living in my belly for the past 9 months oh, that's right yeah yes 
So it was an odd feeling. And so I wanted to have Micah on because especially because of her expertise in in the NICU. And I feel like so many of our children end up there. It's not always the case, but a lot of them end up there due to feeding. And Micah has worked with lots of our little ones and, and also has experience in all areas and in the NICU and feeding as well. So I found it very important and valuable to to have you on today. Thank you. It is very important. Laura, I hear your heart in that. I think it's so very human that you have grown this being in your body and you don't know them yet, but you are so interconnected. And I think that's what's so unnatural about the NICU is that this precious little one that you have grown so fond of and have been interconnected with for however long is essentially ripped from your body and your heart. Like you having to leave the NICU and go home or go back to your room is just so unnatural. And just the essence of what the NICU is, it's so sterile and so medical It almost takes the bonding and the love out of it, which it doesn't take the love out of it, but it just makes it become so procedural that that is a word that a lot of people use. This is so unnatural. This is so not right. And you're correct. It's not. It's not the way that things are supposed to be. And as a neonatal therapist, My goal always is to, as much as possible, reuniting that family unit in as much of a natural way as possible. We found that it just feels right. It's the right thing to do, but research backs it up in not only physical, physiological support for the baby, but also the mental health of the parents as well. So it makes sense when we bring the family back together and put them back together that everybody does better. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Sorry to interrupt, but I need a little bit of help. If you're listening to this on the Apple Podcast app or YouTube, you may see a follow plus sign or a subscribe button. If you're able to, it would mean the world to me if you could follow or subscribe. That's the best way to support this show. If you subscribe, I'm able to show it to potential guests or different brands. It helps to grow the show and reach more communities to continue building awareness about the cleft lip and palate journey on a global scale. Thank you so, so much. Back to the conversation. So... I'm so sorry that you had to go through that because it is so hard. The NICU is no place that anybody ever wants to be. Yeah. But sometimes we just, we find ourselves there. Yeah. When So after my daughter Giselle was born, she was actually in the room. I was able to take her to the room with me because I think that people at the hospital didn't necessarily understand what was going on and the nurses weren't really that educated and what actually happened to Giselle is that she we decided to do I wanted to have a natural as natural as I could birth right tried that but I was in labor for three days and that's a whole other story but one of the things that I'd done some research on is that I wanted to do delayed cord clamping and so we did do that and so from just what I've learned or what people have shared with me is the delayed cord clamping can sometimes cause babies to have jaundice, which is one of the things that I wouldn't say it's like a normal, but there are plenty of babies that have jaundice and then they, they pass that jaundice through urine or bowel movements. And so they're able to overcome Mm -hmm. that. What was happening with Mm -hmm. Giselle is that she wasn't feeding properly because of her palate. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was really, it was a little bit of, of, a combination of those things, right? So her bilirubin levels were high and she wasn't feeding properly. So she was dehydrated. And and so they needed, the reason that they told me that they needed to move her to the NICU is because she needed a different level of lighting to get, yeah, Um, to process bilirubin. And so was that, and probably they also probably wanted to get her feeding locked in. And, and so 
when they uh, the doctor called me like late at night and my family had been there and and we were just they were like sitting there and I, I wasn't like saying much to them I was just not knowing I didn't really understand the gravity of the situation but I just felt like an immense anxiety and I wasn't really talking to anybody about how I was feeling it was just one of these things that I internalized and so the doctor called me and he's like, oh, I've been trying to get a hold of you. I We need to, Giselle needs to be moved to the NICU. And we just wanted to make you aware of that, of the reasons why. I didn't, I didn't react because I didn't, my mother was there and I didn't want her to get all worried and so, because she's a little bit of a worry wart. And I, and I just said, okay, my fiance is coming in. He told me that he is at the light, that he's pulling into the hospital can we wait for him to come? And they told me no. They said, yeah. They said, no, she she needs to be moved right now. And I, like at that moment, I it was also like one of these weird things where it's, wow, like you're really not in control of, of these things. Right. And of course, I probably could have pushed back. I probably could have said no. But during that time, like... What they explained to me was, felt scary. And so I, what she needed, I didn't want to be the very... Eating the care. Yeah. And yeah, so, you needed. Um, so yeah, so my question to you is, I guess how, when we are in situations like that, what is the best way to like advocate and when should we like challenge? Yeah, that's the biggest question. And what I always tell parents is, instead of thinking of it as pros and cons, Because really in the NICU, there are burdens to every decision that you're going to make in the NICU. And that's the hard part because at time, not all the time, but there are some times that if we delay, it can cause lifelong problems. And then there are other times where really if we delay, it's not a big deal. So that would be a a question to ask the doctor. And like you did, I like how you put it out there. Can we wait? Can this be delayed? I would love for my husband to be there. And you advocated the right way. Some people would have put their foot down and said, I'm not doing it. And then others would have been like, and not ask at all. And so kudos to you for asking, because a lot of people just, They just retreat and they're like, I'm not the medical professional, so I'm not going to say a word. And I find those are the families that really fall between the cracks. They really have a difficult time. But okay, back to the advocating, asking what you said, can I do this? Can I wait? Can it wait? And if they say no, then say, what is the worst thing that could happen if we do Hmm. wait? And he's no big deal. But sometimes when jaundice gets to a severity level, it really can affect the brain Mm -hmm. and it can happen quickly. And so I don't know what the doctor was thinking, but that may have been in his problem solving as he was critically thinking about her level. Uh, You know what? I don't want it to even get close to that. And so I think that's a really good question to ask. In verbiage to use with the professional, with the doctors, with the nurses, with the specialist, whomever, what are the burdens? What are the benefits? And does it have to be done right now? Mm. If it does have to be done right now, and I don't want to, like in my mama heart or my mama gut, I'm like, something doesn't feel right, then what are going to be the consequences if we choose no? not to do this. And then at that point, you really should be a shared decision maker in your child's medical care. And that doesn't always happen, which is sad. Um, Parents are so often taken out of the decision making and the medical professionals make the decision. That's not Mm. right. You are the baby's parent. You are should be the most important part of the team and you should definitely get a say in that and that's called shared decision making shared for a reason yeah i've always been i think i empathize 
with mothers that just relinquish all they just yeah. kind of let go and I don't think that they do it because they necessarily want to but I feel like they feel powerless in those situations like right they're, they feel like exactly. that's what they're supposed to do I am someone who asks a lot of questions and I think that sometimes maybe that can come off as to use the word combative because that's just terrible to describe someone but I'm gonna ask questions I just am first of all I'm just a curious person I just natural yes. natural curiosity but it was an interesting yes. thing that happened. It's a, this is a side tangent. And, but after I read Giselle's charts and stuff, after when I had time to actually focus on things, I read in her chart that it said like poor communication. And I was offended by that. What does that mean? I, yeah. yeah. And weird. It was a weird thing. But yeah, I think that it is really important for people to speak up about what their needs are. I spoke about a post that I had read recently where it was a mom that was using, I think she was using like a Dr. Brown's bottle. And I told, I I saw like the comments and stuff. And she was saying like, the doctor won't let me use another bottle because everyone in the comments was saying like, change the bottle. If your baby's not gaining weight or you can't get the bottle to work or something like that, then mm -hmm. just try she was using dr browns and everyone was said try a pigeon and and so she said something like oh the doctor won't allow me or she said that's not my decision it's the hospital's decision and my heart like broke for her a little bit because it is it's as you said it, right. it is really your decision and yeah i guess in understanding why they're saying that is there really a reason or is it just that's the way we've always done it i think the medical community and system, we've gotten into this habit of instead of just explaining things and asking parents what their goals are, we put our goal onto them. Yeah. And that's hard. And you're right. There are some, our own personalities come out too. Some people don't have a problem with confrontation. Some people don't have a problem asking questions. And then other people, that's just not as comfortable for them. But I would encourage all families to ask questions. Why are we doing this? What are we doing this for? Making sure whoever comes to the bedside that they check your baby's armband do they have the right baby? Is this the right medication? Unfortunately, medical professionals are human too. And it's your baby. And it's okay to advocate for them. It is okay all day long to advocate for your baby. Yes, I agree. So I wanted to get a little bit, because I don't have my only experience in NICU care is my own. So, so mm -hmm. what is a level two and a level three neonatal care unit? Right. So the um, Academy of American Pediatrics, they come up and uh, with these different levels of NICUs. And so the level four would be the highest level of care, like the highest acuity. Those centers, level fours, are doing surgeries. They have all the specialists at that center. Mm -hmm. A lot of the level two and level threes, they may transport the babies over to the level four to either have a surgery or something like that. And then they may transport back to the lower level. So like a level three NICU, you can still have um, respiratory support at a level three you're going to have different specialists come into the NICU. They just may not be there at all times. Mm -hmm. They um, have a um, neonatal nurse practitioner that is in-house 24 hours a day at a level three, level two. So you just have like, these great gradations mm -hmm. of services, intensity. So when you think of the level fours, those are the sickest of the mm -hmm. sick. Then you have a level two, a level three, level two. And then that lower level is what we just think of as like the nursery. Mm -hmm. But they also can provide certain types of care as we're watching to see if a baby needs a higher level of care. Mm -hmm. So a rough kind of, they're very specific type things that happen at different levels, but that's the 
oak yeah. crawl. Yeah. So where do you typically see if it's just like cleft and feeding issues? Is that usually like a level two or level three? Depending on if the family has known about the cleft or not. I work with many families that didn't know that their baby had a cleft before the baby was born. And so they are at whatever possible community hospital that they were planning to deliver at. Um, if a baby has other issues, say they have some significant cardiac issues, which we do find with um, some of our cleft babies, is they may have to be transported to a higher level of care at that point. Yes, we do see lots of babies that have clefts that, that they don't even have to go into the NICU. They may ask me to come and see the baby, and the baby gets to stay with mom and dad in the room. But they just need a little extra support and education, learning how to feed their baby. Um, but with education, the baby does great. We find which bottle works best for the family and the baby and make sure that they do have follow-up because the feeding, when it goes wrong, it can go wrong really quickly. And so we just need to make sure that support is there for that family. Yeah. So I guess what, uh, this is really good. What? Would you be looking for, I guess, if a baby has a cleft and they're like learning how to feed, I guess, what would you be looking for initially to determine this is a good feed? What's the... Yeah. Different professionals have different opinions on that. My opinion... Uh, my opinion is quality over quantity. But we want to make sure that the baby is nourished. The baby cannot grow and the baby cannot be successful in life if it's not getting adequate nutrition. But there's this balance of force feeding a baby. Mm -hmm. And when we force the baby to, to take in a specific quantity of whether that's formula or breast milk or whatever that is, we're running the risk of causing harm, not just at that point, but also down the line. And what I mean by that is we know that these babies that have some difficulty feeding, either because of the lip or the palate, because of the seal or the suction, whatever that may be, it is a little harder for them to feed. A lot of them can overcome that. But they do run the risk of not maintaining or getting adequate nutrition. Mm -hmm. So that is number one. We always want to make sure that the baby is fed adequately. But number two, remembering that the connection, that feeding is so much more than just the intake of meal. Feeding is bonding. Feeding is nurturing. Feeding is connection. And so when we keep that in our mind, that it's more than just the amount that we get in, that's where my opinion kind of changes mm -hmm. with feeding, is that even if it's through a nasogastric tube that we're feeding that baby, how can we bring the family in? How can we improve connection and bonding because we know that's what makes the difference long term in neurodevelopment, as well as if they're going to be a lifelong good eater. Mm. We're not just worried about them eating today and tomorrow. They've got to eat for the rest of their life. Yes. And so it doesn't matter if they can complete a bottle a day, which is important. And it's all building, right? Those little developmental milestones. And we're building that foundation and we're making those good um, strides forward. But ultimately, my goal as a therapist and a speech language pathologist and a feeding specialist is I want them to love eating at six months, one year, at two years, when they're a teenager. I don't want us to have to go through and sometimes we do all that we can, and it still doesn't work. 
But a lot of times if we can make these small little changes at the beginning in helping our babies feed and enjoy it, we can mitigate those risks of pediatric feeding disorders. Yeah. You mentioned a couple of things that I want to touch back on. One of the, one of the one of the things that I was so adamant about is that I did not want Giselle to be on a feeding tube. I was I was it, I'm, it just it was one of those things that I was just like I'm going to do whatever I can to not have that be her experience. Mm-hmm. And I know that sometimes that is the experience of so many people. Mm-hmm. But I guess mm-hmm. what do you it, that that was another thing too so when they came in to do their rounds one one day they asked me they said does Giselle want to eat and I said Giselle loves to eat when she can she's she really I think that she enjoys eating she is trying so hard to eat it's not for her lack of <laughs> for trying wanting to yeah. Yeah. Um, and so she was actually probably a day away from a tube they were they were telling me that she couldn't that they were going to put her on a feeding tube if she hadn't. They, they give her they gave her a goal. She had to have milliliters every two hours at minimum for the day in order for her to not go on the feeding tube. And so I was determined. We were both determined. <laughs> and and yeah, that that was our experience. But how do you? What would you recommend? How would you continue to build that bond if your baby is on a tube? <laughs> Yes. So number one would be a parent being there for if you can all the feedings or if one of you, if y'all could alternate being there, feeding always go better with a parent. And I never want a parent to feel guilty or shame if they can't be in the NICU all the time because some parents have to work. Some parents have other children. They have other obligations. But if there is a way to be there during the feeding, it's amazing how different a baby responds to a parent mm-hmm. as compared to a professional. Mm-hmm. They always respond better to mom or dad. Oh, wow. So if you can be there. Number two, if you can do as much skin to skin as possible mm-hmm. before, after the feedings, in between the feedings, it makes such a huge difference. And even if mom is not wanting to breastfeed long term, the comfort of the baby being at the breast and the practice that the baby gets at the breast is so much more natural. But also the breast is just a natural place for a baby to be. And so to be able to learn somewhere that's safe instead of in the arms of someone that they are unfamiliar with this random thing going in their Mm -hmm. mouth, it makes a a big difference. Now, will the baby be able to breastfeed successfully and meet all their nutritional needs? That is so determined by mom's anatomy, baby's anatomy, how much milk mom had, so many things. But just being at the breast, it can't say enough about it. Just be all in the parent, dad included, being on them all the time makes such a big difference. Yeah, it helps build that connection and that bond, I would assume. And yeah. Absolutely. I think absolutely. That's, that's interesting too. They had, they, when Giselle was in the NICU, they gave me this, this flyer and I'm, I thought that this was a little odd, but like, understood it. But like, it was like someone that could come in to snuggle your baby. It was like a, a program that they had. And I can't remember what the program yes. was called. Yes. But I, I always tell uh, people that I really lucked out in a way. And, and I, I lucked out in the way that I was I'm in the position that I am in my life right now. To I was able to tend to Giselle my career and things like that are settled. I work from home. My my schedule is pretty flexible. So I could go to the NICU as I needed to. And and I didn't have to struggle to, to go see her, to be there physically with her. But there are so many parents out there that don't have that. I and know. they, so you know, have that so heartbreaking. Like just even thinking about it almost makes you want to cry. But 
you have some volunteer or something to be able to go in to build like keep with your exactly exactly yeah. yeah and even during therapy sometimes that's the most therapeutic thing that we can do after i feed a baby and i know that the parents may not be able to come it may be that i hold the baby and for them to be able to hear a human's heartbeat it just reminds them of being back in the womb. The natural heat from our bodies keeps them much more comfortable than the heater in their incubator. The smell of a human is so much better than the medical sterile smell of all the different cleaning products yeah. in the in the incubator or just in the crib itself. And I know it's so hard. Parents never want to not be there. It is rare that a parent, I just don't want to be there. It's that there's so much life just happening around you that sometimes you can't. And depending on the NICU, some NICUs allow grandparents to come in and hold the baby. And then they have the volunteer programs, which are the sweetest thing. And that's what I want to do when I retire. Uh, I want to go and be the baby holder. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Yes. All day, every day. No, it's it's the most beautiful thing. I know I'm telling, I have to be honest, when I saw it, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to let yeah. a stranger come in and hold my girl. And I was so like protective of it. Yeah. Huh. But you have these families that say they we're in Texas and we're in Dallas. So we have a huge hub. Mm -hmm wonderful two wonderful level multiple level fours but two really huge hospital systems that have the best NICU mm -hmm. some of these babies are care flighted in three four hours away unless parents are able to get a hotel or a Ronald McDonald house room or something like that they may not be able to come every day. When they come, they have to stay for a while. Then they have to go home and care for others yeah. and work. Yeah, you're right. Not every family has that. Um, yeah. And so it, is, it sounds weird to have these volunteers, but that's the yeah. science behind yeah, it. Yeah, like it's so interesting. So like when I, first, when I first got the flyer, I was like, this is a strange thing. But then when you actually really think about it, just as a way that you've explained it to me, explained it here for the audience as well, is they're literally in in their the little crib thing, right? Uh, all day. Right. Or their yeah, their crib all, all day until feedings. And so they're there. They're not really doing much of anything. And right. depending on what hospital your baby is at, the nurses are making their rounds. Usually in the NICU, they don't have many babies. They they don't have too many, but they're making their rounds. They're concerned with other babies. Sometimes other babies have additional needs. I know that with Giselle, she was being she was roomed with with twins actually. So they were they were preemie twins. And some sometimes the nurses are a little spread thin, and they don't necessarily have all the time to just get a snuggle. They're just trying to get their feeds in and chart and do their job do their job and so something that i do in hindsight i'm like yeah that actually is a really great program for babies and it's like really needed i think and yeah they're sweet and during covid we couldn't have hardly anybody come into the hospital and all of those volunteer programs were wiped oh, away yeah. so it's so nice to know that they're coming mm -hmm. back it is there's so much science behind it too, the research of why, of why that's needed. And I think it, it, it does, it, it makes it, it reminds us that we're so mm -hmm. human. The medical advances are so important and we're, we're able to save babies and we are younger and younger. It's amazing how young we can save this baby, but that they thrive when they have those connections with humans. Yeah. And just remembering that, I think, tells parents how important they yeah. are. They're bad, but say that they're a visitor. And I've always told our NICUs, take visitor off that badge. They, parents are not a visitor. They are parents. Number one supporter. Oh, yeah. I like that. I like the sound of it. You mentioned breastfeeding. So you, uh, you know I'm going to ask you about breastfeeding. Yeah. Yes. 
<laughs> so breastfeeding with a cleft is it really depends on who you're talking to. For the most part, I think that people yep. are very I know the team that I worked with, they back up. Giselle was born with a cleft palate. Uh it was pretty wide and they were pretty adamant that I could not breastfeed Giselle. And and in my I was trying, I wanted to, I attempted to and once they just told me you're like it's not gonna happen. And, and so I pumped for months after that. I was able to do that. A very stressful journey. We'll also talk about that. Yes. But yeah, so I know I've spoken to some mothers that have been able to breastfeed with their baby is born with a cleft lip only. No palate isn't involved. Um and so I guess what is your thoughts or your opinions about this? I've heard varying opinions about breastfeeding with cleft palate, with cleft lip. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I have so many. I have to be an entire podcast on that. I love that. Okay. So, yeah. Number one, reiterating, we have to keep in mind that the nutrition of the baby is the most important. And so whatever our goal is, we have to make sure that our goal is to make sure the baby maintains nutrition. If mom's goal, if it's the family's goal to breastfeed, we have to, I think some practitioners don't want to get parents' hopes up sometimes. They're afraid that moms can't handle mm -hmm. it. And I'm like, these moms are like the strongest moms you have ever seen. You're not going to scare them off by saying this might be hard. You're already in the hardest journey of your right. life, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's odd. Again, that's where we would go, okay, there are benefits and burdens. With that burden, when you tell me I can't do it, why? And the reason mainly is they're afraid that the baby won't get nutrition, mm -hmm. adequate nutrition. So... My number one thought is with the skill of a lactation counselor, a speech language pathologist, lactation consultant, are there things that we could do as a team to help this mother baby dyad to be successful in meeting that? Mm. It might be that we have a supplement attached to your breast. So the baby may be able, depending on suction, if the baby can actually seal get a good latch, and then actually have this suction to pull the milk from the breast. If they're just not getting enough, but they're getting some, why couldn't we put a supplementer on the breast, supplement while the baby is breastfeeding at the breast, and give them maybe half, maybe even more, through the supplement supplementer at the breast? Another option is we practice at the breast. And then after whatever surgery where we have some repair, the baby is actually able to whatever they're not able to do before, whether that get a good latch, get a good feel, get a good suction. Then the baby is not learning this new skill. The baby's been at the breast the whole time, practicing, maybe even non nutritive Maybe the baby is not even able to pull milk, but the baby's been at the breast. So it's not this whole new situation. Mm. Once they have the anatomy repaired, they're like, oh, exactly what to do now. Oh, look at me. I can actually get a suction yeah. now. There are so many options. It's just, yeah, I think sometimes the team just wants to make sure that the baby is going to grow. Mm -hmm. That not just the body, but the brain is getting adequate nutrition and hydration. And sometimes by telling the parent, it's just not going to happen. They think they're doing the parents a favor. Mm. When if that really is the family's goal, I want to do everything in my toolbox that we can to try it. And when we get to the end of the toolbox and I'm like, we have tried everything. Yeah. Then giving them the option, you can continue to put the baby at breast, but I don't think they're getting any adequate nutrition. Here are the next steps that we need to take to look at. Yeah. That almost, that makes me like angry too. Cause like I think about my own experience and I think, and you sharing that, like how valuable it is to what the options are. And it just takes someone that's like really patient. And I actually really think that it takes someone who actually cares, like who really like cares. And I, I think I'm thinking back in, on my own experience, 
and this is not about me, but you just reflect, I'm, I'm thinking about these things now as you're speaking. But I just remember this woman's face and she came in and she told me that isn't, she like looked at me and said, it's not going to happen. It's not possible for you. And I just remember her walking out and she, and before she closed the door, she goes, and she just took like a deep breath. And I I thought to myself, was I frustrating? Did I say or anything? Like, what? Or or was she feeling like upset that she had to deliver bad right. news? I always try to assume positive intent there, you know, to someone or she thought I it think. was like heartbreaking. I would, I would hope. But then part of me is, I guess she was just frustrated with telling me that. I, I don't know. But I had never heard what you just told me and that is i've heard you to have your baby at the breast to like you feed for a comfort or something like that i, f I forget what the saying is or, or something mm -hmm. like that but that's fascinating that you're saying i've never heard it said this way that do like a trial like you get them used to the area so that you could potentially after they have surgery um, have them latch. And so that is so many moms have asked this question. Have, has anyone out there b successfully had their baby latch after repair? I feed, I've fed all my kids before and I feel like there's some disconnect yeah. with this baby, with my baby that has a cleft because I wasn't able to experience that. And so I want to, and, and can I do it after repair? And of course there's varying responses to that, but, uh, but yeah, that is fascinating. Have you seen that done successfully where someone after repair has been able to get their baby to latch or, yes yes and i'm so sorry that you went through that experience like on the behalf of medical professionals everywhere no really i'm just sorry that as a community we're not showing up to you to families that are in the hardest struggle of their life and just come in guns ablaze and no, it's a hard no. What's wrong with having a lactation counselor, a speech therapist like myself assess mm. it and say, okay, here are the things that are working great. Here are the things that are not. And to successfully breastfeed, we need A, B, and C. But you can do this and this. And it just boggles yeah. my mind. I'm sorry. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, I was actually, now but, that I know, I, I was, everything was happening so quickly for me in that moment. And so I didn't really understand what was going on, but she was a feeding therapist. She was the therapist that came in to see me. Yeah. To give me my bottles and stuff. So now, like in hindsight, I'm actually really shocked by her, by the way that my situation was handled. And I don't know, I think maybe, maybe it was late in the day. I, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. I know. And I want to give benefit of the doubt too, because obviously I was not in the room and I didn't see your breast tissue. I didn't see your daughter's palate. I didn't see how you fit together. And that's really the only way that we can make our determinations is actually seeing if when parents come to me and they say, yeah, somebody told me this and this, I'm like, so they watched an entire feeding. They watched you the pre-feeding, the feeding, after the feeding. And they were like, no, I just told them what happened. It's really hard to assess and make an evaluation and make recommendations when you don't. Yeah. 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 But you're right. I, I can't make a judgment on that. But recommendation to the mamas and the daddies out there is to find a, a team a feeding therapist that listens to you and that when you tell them your goals, these are my goals, that they listen. And if you ask them, will you make my goals your goal as the family? You're asking the therapist, are my goals important to you as a therapist? And they come back and go, it might be that you might need to find a new therapist. Yeah. Yeah. Because truly, as therapists, we need to make the family's goal our goal. Yeah. That was the only experience that I had like that. And then after, I actually went, I felt like she was still struggling to feed. We were sent home with a Dr. Brown's bottle with a bowel 
And I still felt like she wasn't quite right. But they saw me in the office, in the actual office. And they watched her feed, as you said. And they right. saw what was what she was experiencing. And, and it wasn't, she told me, she said, why don't we just, why don't you try the pigeon bottle and see mm-hmm. if that works better for her? And mm-hmm. she loved it. It was a faster flow. <laughs> yeah, it was like from one day to another, it was like she was feeding so much better. Uh, Wonderful. And so I think that like our community is push the Dr. Brown's bottle, Dr. Brown's, do Dr. Brown. And I've always been curious about why that is when we have other options. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I love Dr. Brown's bottles, but for some babies, they don't work. And I'll tell you why I love Dr. Brown's. For the longest time, as therapists, we're taught to make decisions on evidence, on research. And so bottle system don't really have that except for Dr. Brown. Mm -hmm. And so as therapists, we really like to be able to refer to especially a piece of medical equipment. It really is a piece of equipment that we're using to help our babies, especially in the naked. Those throwaway bottles that they give you at the hospital, those nipple, like those vary, like the flow rate varies so greatly. And with Dr. Brown, every preemie nipple, every transitional or newborn nipple, every level one if you pick up a preemie, it will be the exact same flow rate as the next preemie mm-hmm. nipple. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? The flow is very predictive. It's going to be consistent, which is very important for sick babies. Yeah. They need to know that the flow rate of the, the nipple coming at them is not going to overflow them. It's going to be consistent to what it was the last time. And with the Dr. Browns, we love the valve because then all the baby has to do is the compression. They don't have to have that positive and negative pressure. Mm. They can just compress. They don't have to compress and pull. And so I'll tell you, that's probably the main reason that a lot of practitioners do love. That's the reason that I love Dr. Browns. But I am not above saying it doesn't work for every baby. Yeah. And listening to the parents, like listening to you and your mama gut going something, this still is not right. She's still struggling. Mm. Is there any other option? And you're right. Some babies do better on the pigeons. Some babies do better on the hypermouth. It's just, let's at least try it. There's nothing wrong with trying. Yeah. I actually, it's so funny because I don't even think that it had to do with her. I think it was user error. I think it was me. Like, I oh if I wasn't it just wouldn't come out like I oh uh, yeah like I would wash them they you know I saw online oh you know sometimes the milk and I was using breast milk sometimes it can be you know fatty and and it can clot the valve I would mm-hmm. wash them and do all kinds of right? things and scrub them to death uh-huh. and it's still I was still having issues with it and I was so stressed out that I'm like I can't fight a bottle every every feed. She's no, screaming and it. so tired of figuring the trying to figure this out. She's not eating from it. What next? Let's move on. What can I try? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I, you know, I just yeah. wanted to get her fed. That was- that's right. That's right. Yep. Get that nutrition in. Yes. Oh, so the next thing I want to ask you about is pumping. So uh, a lot of us um, cleft moms, we uh, have some varying experience where someone tells us we can't breastfeed or we're pushed to the bottle and we're really, or some of us are just so stressed out that we're not able to to try the practice of trying to get the baby on the breast and, and that type of thing. But we want to give our babies breast milk. And so we resort to, so I did not know the amount of work. You are not lying. And so what are some of, how do we get through it? What's the best way to, to keep mm-hmm. going? And yeah. yeah. What are some tips on that? Okay. Tips. Lots of skin to skin. Lots of skin to skin. And I'm not just saying like the baby in clothes on top of your clothes. I'm talking you've got your shirt off or you've got your button down shirt open, bra off. Baby is 
skin on skin. You need to have that connection because you're losing that because you're not getting to actually feed at the breast. Mm. So if all we feel like is that we're just a product producer of milk, there there's something that switches in our brain when we don't get to have that connection with our baby. And so I would say try to connect with your baby actual skin to skin as much as you can. Even if your baby, number two, even if your baby can't feed at the breast, allowing them to find comfort at your breast. That will not only cause oxytocin, prolactin, all those good hormones that allow your milk to actually flow, um, it also decreases your stress. And so those are those love hormones, those good hormones. And so the pump doesn't make you produce that. A baby being on your skin does. So skin to skin I think is the answer to all the world's problems. I love that. Number two is we have forgotten that people didn't always have these machines. And we've forgotten that our hand actually is the best breast Mm. pump. And it is a lost art. Hand expression is a lost art. But I think hand expression can be in your toolbox if you're pumping with a mechanical pump. Number three is give yourself a lot of grace because you're right. It is a full-time job trying to pump, then trying to feed the baby, then trying to get all the other things done. It's hard. But mamas of babies with clefts are the toughest mamas that I've met. I know that you've got it in you. And... If you're pumping and you're that committed to getting breast milk, like we talked about before, it may be worth a visit to a lovely feeding therapist or speech pathologist or lactation consultant like myself to say, okay, now we've had the repair. Let's try this mm-hmm. again and see if we if you can take that part of the pumping out of the equation. At some point, it's helpful. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's a phenomenal. I've never heard someone say that either. Yeah. That's wonderful advice. So how do you, aside from the skin to skin, Mm -hmm. do do any of these like supplements or food or things that people say to try, do they actually increase your milk? Sometimes they increase it too much. And then we get, yeah, we are in this Raised. Nobody has enough meal. We actually, when we take all these, now there are some moms that have inadequate milk supply. Okay. I'm not saying that there aren't, but we jump to that. I don't have enough milk. I've got to take all these cookies and lactation cookies. I'm making all this tea and all this stuff. We come and then we have an oversupply problem and we have these duck fat we can't empty enough and we have this overproduction then we get clogs then we get mastitis then we have blebs then we it's just this kind of ongoing thing and so it's very important to not take all that unless you know from a professional that truly is the problem you actually can then tip yourself to the other side of overproducing and that really is another problem in and of itself. Yeah. Clogs are so painful. I had one one time and I went to, oh God, I went to who it was actually a visit that I had post-op or no, not post-op, postpartum. Postpartum? Yeah. Huh? And my midwife, she, I was like, I have a clog. It hurts so bad. And she's okay. Get it out. And she squeezed me so much, squeezed me so hard. And it just shot out the room. Yeah. And I'm like, I felt some relief, but then I was sore and stuff. And it it was awful. It was probably due to like inconsistent pumping and that type of thing, like not being able to, like producing and not being able to get it out fast enough as you've shared. Yeah. Just, I was also thinking, you've shared a little bit about this, but what should someone look for in their feeding team? Like what kind of questions should families be asking to determine if that is the right feeding team for them? 
I would definitely ask experience, not that every person has to have 25 years of experience, but there is something to that. This is a higher level of just providing inner elementary care. Like this is advanced knowledge. And so your care team for your feeding specialist needs to have advanced knowledge. They need to be able to meet you at your advanced needs. I would definitely ask them if they have worked with baby with CLAP mm -hmm. before. Um, that would be a red flag if they haven't. Number two, what their stance, what their opinion is on what your goals are as a family. They may be an incredible therapist, but if they're not willing to meet you and work on the goals that you have as a family, they just might not be the right fit. Not that they're a bad therapist. It's just, we're just not the right fit. And then third would be, what is their opinion on, like you said, on if goal, if your goal is breastfeeding, what is their opinion? Do they have experience with helping families transition? Those sort of things. So Part of that is you trying to figure out what's important to you as a family, too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't always know that, but you knew you really wanted to try breastfeeding. So that was important to you. Yeah. Those sort of things. You go some of those things. Yeah, you go in kind of like with their own goals and stuff. So just in closing, what is the best advice that you would give to a mom who is struggling with feeding or whose baby is in the NICU currently? Mm. I wish I could give them a big hug, first of all, and tell them that although it's hard right now, this is, this is a journey. And my best advice would be look at that precious baby and try to connect as closely as you can. Soak up every baby smell, every whimper, every smile. Try to just soak it all in and take a picture of it in your mind every second because it is hard. It's really hard. Those little babies grow up so fast and it really is a journey and you as a mama of a baby with a cleft, are so strong. And I hope you hear that from me. You are so strong. You are the best mommy for that baby. And don't be afraid to reach out to other people that are ahead of you, that are one step ahead of you, mm -hmm. two steps ahead of you. People that you feel you can confide in and ask questions. Don't do it alone. Nobody has to do it alone. Mm -hmm. We're not meant to do it alone. Um, and then get help for yourself mm. because your baby needs you to be the best that you can be. And it's a hard journey and it's not a short little sprint. This is going to be a bit of a marathon and your family needs you to be at your best. So whether that means going to counseling and working through some of those unmet expectations and working through the grief of having a baby with a cleft. That doesn't mean that you're a bad mom. Mm -hmm. That means that you're self-aware and that you want to be the best that you can be for your family. Yeah. And I would say, Mommy, you are doing a great job. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> just want to take you up in my arms and give you a big hug is what I want to do. That is awesome. And I, like, yeah, I get emotional just thinking about that. And I just want to thank you, Micah, for being here with us today and if you want, where can people reach you for a consultation, for advice, or however kinds oh, of things? Yes. yes, please reach out to me. Yes, I would love to talk. If you do want a feeding consultation, I would love to do that. But if you just want to ask me a question, I'm happy to answer. My website is Micah Clark, and you spell that M I C H A. C L A R K dot com. And then my Instagram handle is Micah underscore Clark. And I'm also on Facebook, which is Micah Warren, W A R E N Clark. 
So any of those reach out, I'm happy to answer any questions. I do virtual um, assessments evaluation too, if that's helpful. And I'm in the Dallas DFW area for in-person. Perfect. Thank you so much, Micah. It was such a pleasure having you on oh. today. Oh, I'm nice to talk to you. And thank you for sharing your story. I know it's hard. It's vulnerable. So thank you. Thank you all for listening to the Our Forever Smiles Clef Mom Diaries and Support Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and submit a review of the podcast wherever you listen. I hope that you've enjoyed this audio experience. Maybe you cried a little, laughed a little, but more importantly, I hope that you feel a little piece of reassurance and even joy in your journey. Talk to you next week.